Mother is having one of those really bad days. And then her son came in who was playing outside with his pants torn. She sent him immediately to his room to mend his own pants. Sometime later, she came to see how he was doing with his assigned project and noticed that there was a pair of torn pants lying across a chair and then the basement door was open. She walked to the top of the steps and with a loud and a stern voice, she yelled down the steps, are you running around down there without your pants on? An unexpected deep voice reply came back. No, ma'am, I'm just down here reading your gas meter. <laughs> it's easy to make a mistake, but what happens if we are wrong about the future resurrection, that there is no future resurrection? Let's think about that today in hypothetical form, if we might. Let me read to you our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to see where Paul is going to list some hypotheticals. If there is no future resurrection, then this is where you are, child of God. Can you imagine that? Because what have we been taught? I'll tell you what we've been taught. 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And then there's going to come a time when Jesus comes back, right, for us, and he's going to resurrect the body and reunite it with the soul. But what if there is no future resurrection. Let's start this. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Well, that's something to think about, isn't it? Let's pray. Father, how can we go through life truly not living as if Jesus Christ is raised from the dead? But Father, just for these few moments, help us to take a look at this passage from Paul's vantage point, contemplating that if there is no future resurrection and there are many implications with it, Father, may we leave here today greatly encouraged that there is a future resurrection because Christ conquered death and we have hope. Bless our study, Father, in a very special way I ask you now in Jesus' name. Paul lays out the setting for us in verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, Paul phrases this in the Greek in a first-class condition, assuming that Christ is being preached, that he has been raised from the dead. And what I love about this, it's the concept that he has been raised in the past and he continues to be raised today. And can I ask you quite honestly, are you living in light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That he has been raised in the past and that he is risen today and he makes the promise to you and to me that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christ was being heralded. He was being trumpeted that he had been raised from the dead. Then Paul asks this question. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. Why did some of the Corinthians come to the conclusion that there is no future resurrection? Turn with me to Acts chapter 17 and let me set the uh, stage for you. The Greeks came out of a background of dualism. Dualism is usually associated with Plato. It basically taught that anything that is spirit 
is good. But anything that is material, think about your body, is bad. And see, so freedom would come in the future because when you died, what were you freed from? The material. You would be freed from your body. And let me just take you, if you will, before I read you these few verses, beginning in Acts 17, verse 22, even a step further. What were some of the other philosophies of Paul's day as he was preaching to the Athenians? You had the Epicureans. They essentially said that the chief end of man was pleasure. The reason you are here is, if you will, to experience pleasure, not just physical pleasure, but intellectual pleasure as well. These Epicureans also believe that matter was eternal. In other words, God didn't create the world. It has always existed. And then you add also another group of folks called the Stoics, okay, followers of Zeno. And they were pantheists, basically saying that God is in creation. If you will, when you look at the universe, God is in all of that. Not that he made it and is outside of it, but God literally permeates those things. Now, with that in mind, knowing to whom Paul is preaching, see what he points out, Acts 17, beginning in verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. That's, if you will, the uh, Athenian high court, like the Supreme Court. They've gathered together. And he said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. See, they had an altar said to the unknown God. Paul says, hey, let me tell you who the true God is. Now, pick up in verse 24, because this is critical to understanding how Paul connects with those folks. It also shows how he corrects the thinking of the Athenians and, if you will, the Corinthians. Verse 24, God who made the world and what? Everything in it. Do you remember after the days of creation, what did God say about it each day? It's good. And you get to the sixth day, and what does God say? It's very good. So therefore, the material is good because who made it? God made it. Who made the body? God made the body. And he cares about the body to the degree that one day he's going to resurrect the body. So he says, God made the world, everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, still in chapter 17, come down to verse 32. Paul now had preached the gospel to these people, beginning with creation, and then he says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And you notice this, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So, what was the response? Doubt, because since material is bad, how can there be a future resurrection? This is what Paul is dealing with. Now, as you're going back to 1 Corinthians 15, Philip Yancey describes a unique funeral custom among African Muslims. Close family and friends at the funeral would, if you will, circle around the casket, looking at the corpse and not saying anything. There would be no tears. There would be no music. If you will, there would be nothing but silence. And in this tradition, at a certain point, everybody was given a piece of peppermint candy. Now, some of you would go, that's the highlight of the funeral, having a peppermint candy. I know some of you, OK? And what they would do at the point of time they were instructed to do so was put it in their mouth and just let it dissolve. Then the point was made, if you will, at the funeral that basically for this person, their life is over. Your life just dissolves. Can you imagine having that concept that one day when you die, if you will, you just dissolve and it's totally over? Let me start you with the first hypothetical that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You see, if there is no future resurrection, number one, Christ is not risen. Did you get that? If there is no future 
resurrection, then Christ is not risen. In verse 13, he says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. See, if the dead cannot rise, it's because Jesus was not raised. Do you see how the two, if you will, stand and fall together? Because, see, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then nobody else is going to be raised from the dead in the future. And if nobody in the future is going to be raised from the dead, you know why? It's because Christ was not raised himself. This is a huge issue. The second issue as well that Paul points out, the second hypothetical is simply this. Preaching would be pointless. You know what I've spent part of my life doing, everyone? is looking at the Word of God, trying to figure out the text of Scripture says, and then make a point, right? Preaching would be pointless. Because if there's no future resurrection, what is the sense to preach? Winston Churchill advised, if you have an important point to make, don't try to be subtle or clever. Use a pile driver. Hit it once and come back and hit it again. But can I ask you, what point do you make if there is no future resurrection? What point do we make if Christ was not raised from the dead? Paul continues in verse 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. Have you ever played with kids who get that little bubble blower? Isn't it fun to watch kids? You know, they get that little thing, and they, they have their little soap mixture, and they just blow bubbles. Now, if you can envision this, from the time I started this sermon today, me blowing one big bubble. And by the end of the sermon, we would have this massive bubble, right, in the entire building. And I know one of you ladies would take out your hairpin. You'd be too tempted not to, right? And what would you do? You'd pop the bubble. See, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, if there is no future resurrection, then there is no point to preaching. It is all empty. It is hollow. That's what this word vain means. It means to be hollow of anything. Wow. Have you ever asked this question now, looking at the other side of this? What does God obsess over? Can I tell you what God does obsess over? Self-communication. He does. God obsesses over communicating who he is. See, he does this in two ways. The first way he does it is through general revelation. In Psalm 19, it says this, and starting in verse 1, the heavens do what? The heavens do what? They declare. See, they're recounting. If you will, they're preaching. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. The word for firmament means to beat out. Have you ever looked at the expanse of the sky? And it goes on and on and on and on. Who beat out the sky? God did that, right? And the heavens are talking to us. Verse 2. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. I look out at the sun, and I'm going, hey, there's a smart God who put that sun 93 million miles out there. Then at night, I look at the stars, and on course as they travel, and I'm going, someone that is awfully powerful put those stars out there, and the scripture says he even knows them by name. The billions and billions and billions of them. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So God does. He obsesses over self-communication through general revelation. If you will, general revelation deals with, if you will, general communication at all the time. Because it doesn't tell you specifically who made it. I can't look at the sun and say, well, I know exactly who made that. What do you need? You need special revelation. You had particular people talking at a special time communicating a message. That's what we're at in 1 Corinthians 15. It's revelation, right? Paul says, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead when? On the third day. That's special revelation. We should be so excited 
that we were just not left with general revelation of creation but God tells us specifically who made the sun, who made the stars, who made the moon, and tells us how we can have a right relationship with him. He gets very particular in that. And by the way, that is why Paul would say in Romans 1.18, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And if you will, Jesus took his baton in Matthew chapter 28, and he says, now I'm handing you the baton of truth, and he says, you go and you make disciples of all the nations. And can I ask you something? As I look at our state where about 52% of the people voted for gay marriage, how have we permeated this state? With whom have we shared the gospel of Jesus Christ? With whom have we taken under wing and said, let me talk to you and tell you the ways of God? That the one that I worship, Jesus Christ, said, he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. My friends, when we look at the ills of society and we see what is going on all around us in a compromise, I just ask you this, what are we doing about it as children of God? We have been handed the baton of truth and we are to communicate that truth from one generation to the next generation and we just say, this is what I stand upon and I'm not going to my right, I'm not going to my left, this is truth, this is what I believe, now let me pass it on to you. Well, you talk about moral decline just over a number of decades. If we don't become salt, if we don't become light, if we don't take the word of God and start to pass it along. And my friends, we are excuseless when it comes to sharing the gospel. Because remember what Jesus said to his disciples just before he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Do you remember what he said? He says, you go and wait. And when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, I'm going to make you a witness for me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the othermost parts of the world. The moment the Spirit of God came into our lives when we believed on Christ, he has empowered us to be a witness for him. And I'm asking, where are all the witnesses? Why aren't we speaking up? Why aren't we telling people, God saved my soul. This is what I was. But now this is who I am because of Jesus Christ. This is how I lived. But now this is how I live because of Jesus Christ. My friends, so are we getting it? This is what has been communicated to us. And if Christ has been raised from the dead and he is with us today and he promises to be with us, why are we intimidated and why are we holding back? And why aren't we speaking up for Christ? And why aren't we living for him if his presence is right with us? See, if you have no future resurrection... Preaching would be pointless. Can I tell you something even further, number three? Faith in the gospel would be pointless. Wow, because you have nothing to believe in. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead because there's no future resurrection, we have nothing to look forward to. See, my friends, your faith is only as good as the object of your faith. Guys, you remember your first weight set? Remember your first 110 pound weight set? Can you remember? I remember mine so very well. And the thing that was so frustrating is the way the bar was designed, when you wanted to put weights on it, you kind of had to hold it with one hand and slip like the 10 or the 15 pound on the other because if you didn't, what, what happened? Fell over, right? And, and then we grew up and we started looking at Olympic weight sets, right? Okay, guys, just work with me for a moment. You got that 45-pound precision bar, and it was so fun because you could take your 45-pound plate, and as the bar was sitting there, you could just walk to one side, and you could put it on and slap it on there so everybody could see you got a 45-pound plate, right? That's how it works, okay? But it wouldn't spill. Why? Because the object of your faith could handle the weights that it was designed for. Didn't want to leave you out, ladies. Didn't want to leave you out. So on Facebook the other day, and I looked and I go, this can't be it. There was a set of legs pasted on one of the Facebook pages. Now, the people I have as my friends generally don't post a set of legs on the Facebook page. And upon further investigation, okay, there was something that really struck me. And I know you guys are going, boy, how's he going to get out of this? And all the women are going, boy, he's really in trouble. I noticed this little pair of heels, three inches high, holding up that gal's weight. 
And you got to be honest with me for a moment. For some gals to have those spikes, it takes a little bit more faith to really believe that's going to hold that person up, okay? But what is faith? Faith is only as good as the object of your faith. What can hold you up? What can hold you up? This is the definition of faith, biblically, is taking God at his word and acting upon it. It's knowing that I believe in the word of God because it is eternally true and God cannot lie and I can put all my hope, all my trust and everything that I have in it because it's true. Can you imagine raising a son and you teach him how to play baseball and you say, hey, there's this place in Cooperstown and if you're really good, one day you wind up in the baseball hall of fame. Just saw some slides when we went there years ago and they stayed in the cabin of Hades. That's really a story by itself. Or, you know, you, you've got sons that are going to play football. And, you know, you, you tell them about this place in Canton, Ohio. And, you know, one day you can go and you can see the Super Bowl rings and you can see the old helmets. You know, there was Sonny Jurgens and, oh, how fun it was to see all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about? But what happens if you raise your children? And one day you go to take the trip and you find out there is no Cooperstown and Baseball Hall of Fame. There is no Canton, Ohio, and there is no Football Hall of Fame. See, the object of your faith was what? Futile. There was no point to it whatsoever. So do you understand if Christ has not been raised from the dead and there is no future resurrection, then why are we here? And why do we bother to read our Bibles? And why do we bother to live like Christians? And why do we pass the baton of truth? Because it's not truth then to the next generation. You see how this works, my friends? This is so very important. If there is no future resurrection, the gospel would be pointless. But it's not. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. But by the grace of God, Paul says, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in, give me that next word, vain, it wasn't empty. Paul took a lot of abuse because he knew there was a future resurrection. Paul took a lot of abuse because he knew that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. There was a hope that went along with this. The fourth hypothetical, if there's no future resurrection, the apostles and other witnesses to Christ's resurrection would be liars. Wow, it's true, right? When Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.24 and he says, whom God raised up, pointing to Jesus Christ, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. No future resurrection. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, Peter's a liar. Plain and simple. And how about Job? Poor Job. Job understood his troubles were so bad that there was no hope in the present life. What did he look for? The life to come. In Job chapter 19, verse 26, this is what he says, and after my skin is destroyed. He was probably waiting for his skin to be destroyed. This I know that in my flesh I shall see God. See, if there's no future resurrection, if Jesus isn't raised from dead, Job had no hope, nothing to look forward to whatsoever. You see in the second half of verse 15 here, notice it says, because we have testified of God, this is Paul and the others, that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. And in verse 16, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. You know, Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, if you be then raised with Christ. Can I ask you, have you been raised with Christ? Positionally you have, because when Jesus was raised from the dead, who was he raised for? You and me. So Paul says, if you be then raised with Christ, assuming it to be true, he says, seek those things which are above. See, if there's no future resurrection, if Christ was not raised from the dead... It's a waste of time talking about seeking heavenly things. He says, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died, and your life in Christ now is hidden. But when Christ, who is our life, appears, not if, when. How do we know that? Because he was raised from the dead. Then, 
if you will. We will have great reward at that time because we will also appear with him in glory. This is so huge, my friends. If these things are not true, if it's a fable about future resurrection, if it's an untruth about Christ's resurrection, then we have nothing to live for whatsoever. The fifth hypothetical Paul gives, and boy, think about this, all people would still be in their sins. You and I would not have forgiveness of sins. We would be miserable. Verse 17 says, and if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. It's a different Greek word. It's not kenos that was used of emptiness or vanity earlier. This is the word that means devoid of truth. See, if Christ is not risen, your faith is devoid of truth, and you are still in your sins. Man. Can you imagine how bum John the Baptist would have been? Speaking to his disciples, when he points out Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's no future resurrection. If Christ was not raised from the dead, we're still in our sins. Every bad thing you had ever done, my friend, is still affixed to you. Every sin that you ever had committed would still, if you will, you would be accountable for each and every one. Can you imagine that? Ooh, I shudder at that thought. Number six, all believers who have already died would have eternally perished. You know, those moms and those dads and those grandmothers and those relatives who had put faith in Christ, some of whom I've preached funerals for, right? They're dead. They're gone. If there is no future resurrection, if Christ was not raised from the dead, they're just gone. Forget it. Take out the peppermint candy, let it dissolve in your mouth because there is nothing more. And then Paul could not have been the one who penned in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Wow. Important issues? You better believe. And then finally, finally we will see in number seven, Christians would be the most pitiable people on earth. You know, you have to show the biggest loser. You got it? The biggest loser. You know who the biggest losers would be? Us. We would be. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, and I'll tell you why we'd be the biggest losers. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's talk about Paul for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. False prophets had crept into the church of Corinth. Paul was defending the truth. And basically, you know how you can tell the people who are genuine versus those that are not? The ones who aren't genuine, when trouble comes, they go exit stage left. The hireling, it talks about in John chapter 10, not the true shepherd. As soon as something goes wrong, what does the hireling do? He goes, you're not paying me enough. I'm out of here, right? But what does the true shepherd do? He stays and he fights off the wolves. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, think about this. Paul says about the false prophets, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. Have you ever been beaten so often you go, I can't even recall how many stripes I've gotten. I remember each one I've got. I can tell you every punch in the mouth I've ever received. I can tell you every elbow to the head. I can tell you every stitch I ever had. I remember every one of them. Can you imagine being beaten for your faith so much that you go, I've, I've lost count? Notice this, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. So many times he goes, I don't know if I'm going to live or I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah, verse 24, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Now think about it. If Christ doesn't raise from the dead, get out your loser sign, everybody, because he's the biggest loser ever. Why would you ever go through all that for something that's not true, right? Let's continue. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils or dangers of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in dangers among false brethren, verse 27, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Ooh, that's quite a list. What have you suffered for Christ? You're not feeling too bad right now, are you? The occasional, you get rejected from a promotion. The occasional getting snubbed here or there, right? 
So little, but look what Paul suffered because he knew Christ was raised from the dead. And you know, Paul lost weight at times. You know how I know he lost weight at times? Look at verse 28. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Man, one church is enough to be in charge of multiple churches and know all the problems and maybe the people who are struggling and not doing well and waking up at 2 a.m. and praying for that person and wondering. Whew. This is Paul. But can I tell you something and take this to heart? You can risk it all. You can risk it all and you should risk it all. You should risk your health. You should risk your finances. You can risk your family. You can risk everything on planet Earth that you possibly have because Jesus has been raised from the dead. And if you will, there is a future resurrection and there will be great reward for the people that have sacrificed for their God. Amen. In closing, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, please. Go towards the book of Revelation, not too far before that. 2 Peter chapter 1. Paul knew when it was about time for him to die. Second Timothy clues us into that. Peter also understands it's about time for him to die. Second Peter chapter 1, and if you'd pick it up with me, please, down in verse 15. See, I think we take so many things for granted, my friends. I do. I think we take it for granted every day that Jesus was raised from the dead. Do you remember when the women went to the tomb? right after Jesus was raised from the dead. What's your concern today? Go ahead, put it in your mind. What's your concern? Think about it. What is your concern? Finances, family, health. What's your main concern? Come on, put it in your mind. What's your main concern? What's your main concern? Whatever it is. Got it? The women come to the tomb and they expect to find a dead savior. And the angel greets the ladies and says, do not be alarmed. In other words, stop fearing because Jesus is alive. Got relatives who know the Lord are about to die. Perhaps a spouse. Perhaps you've had sick children. Perhaps your finances aren't as good off as they could be or your circumstances really just stink. I say to you, stop being afraid because Jesus is alive. And, you know, if 98% of Americans go, we're for gay marriage and we're pro-abortion, and if all the people stand up and they stand for everything contrary to God, stop being alarmed. Jesus is alive. Either he is or he isn't. Either he promises to be with us to the end of the age or he doesn't. Either he makes a difference in our lives or we really don't believe he is there. Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and verse 15, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my what? Deceased, departure. It's the word exodus. Peter's saying, hey, guys, I'm about to check out. I'm getting to go be with my Lord. You all need to carry on. I've passed you the baton of truth, verse 16. Peter says, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What is he talking about there? The tr transfiguration. Remember what Jesus did? He took Peter, he took James, he took John. And before the three of them, if you will, he displayed his glory, at least in part to them. Wow. And they got to see the glory of God. Remember, when Moses is wigged out because the people have, if you will, worn him out. And what does he do in Exodus chapter 33? He says, hey, I got one request. Show me your glory. See, if I can see the face of Jesus and I can know that he is standing with me as Paul understood Jesus being with him, you can throw at me the powers of hell and you can give me every bad circumstance and you can bring death my way and it doesn't matter because in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. These are not fables I preach to you every week. When I preached to you Jonah and the big fish, there was a disobedient prophet who went out and he was disobedient to God. And God says, you know what? You're not going to run away from me, buddy. I'm going to swallow you up. Put him in that big fish. Boy, you want to talk about bad breath? All right. All right. Chronic halitosis. Yeah. And then Jonah learned his lesson. 
But as I walk you through the Bible, you either believe these things or you don't. You know, when I talk to you about the Bible, it says about finances. You either believe what it says or you don't. When the Bible talks to you about child rearing and how to do things God's way, you either believe what the word of God says or you don't. You got what I'm saying, everybody? It's God's way or not. So these things are either true or, you know, Peter would say, you know, hey, when I preached, they weren't fables to you. This is true. He saw the majesty, verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Wow. There was Peter, and all of a sudden Moses appears, and Elijah appears. And what did Peter want to do? Make three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. And hey, Moses and Elijah don't compare to Jesus, so that's when the voice came down. This is my beloved son. This is who it's all about. You hear him. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven when we were with him on a holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. When Peter is writing these things, he saw these things, which you do well to what? To heed. Got it? To heed. To do as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. If you ever meet somebody who goes, I'm the only one who knows what this thing means, you run from that person. It's for everyone. It's for you. It's for me to understand. And then in verse 21, for prophecy. Never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So why should you endure all things for Jesus Christ? All the negatives that come away. Why should we endure all as Paul endured all? Because God's word is true and we are promised a future and we are told that we will have a glorified body one day that will reflect the glorified body of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we don't live for the here and now, but we live for the eternal, knowing what's coming. Would you tell God right now that's who you're going to live for? That you're going to trust his word, that you're going to believe by faith that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, that you're going to receive by faith that he promises to be with us, that when you walk out of this building today, that by faith you're going to know that Jesus Christ goes with you? Would you tell him you're going to embrace the truths of the word of God and not deviate to the left or to the right? And can I tell you, get that baton of truth. Take it. Take it. And you need to start passing that on to others. When you know the truth, it is your obligation to pass that truth on to others. And do not allow any worldly pleasure, any so-called temporal delight, move you away from that which is eternal because Christ is raised from the dead. And he's waiting one day with the anticipation to take his loving child in his arms and says, you've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to give you much. Enter into the joy of the Lord.